STEM enthusiasts, welcome back to Cameron's Lab, Dive In, the go-to podcast for STEM students. Craft it with passion by one of your own. I'm Cameron, your enthusiastic and ever-curious host. Buckle up for today's insightful episode. Ready to dive in? We are live. Hello, everyone uh, that we can see coming in. It's lovely to see you all. So I'll just wait for a few more people uh, to come in and then I will get started. So we've got lots, lots and lots of attendees coming in this afternoon, which is lovely to see. As soon as the number stabilizes a little bit, um, I will kick off. Okay, that number seems to have settled. So I will formally start the webinar. Hello, everyone and a warm welcome to our AI in Healthcare talk, part of Queen Mary's Breakthroughs in AI series. My name is Holly and I am one of the marketing managers in the Faculty of Science and Engineering here at Queen Mary. I'm delighted to be here with you today, joined by two celebrated academics from different parts of our faculty. And I'm also joined by our host, Biomedical Engineering final year student Cameron, who will be leading today's discussion about how AI is being used to transform the diagnosis and treatment of health issues and what the future could hold for these technologies. So before we get started, I'll quickly run over some housekeeping information. We will be with you for between 45 minutes to an hour today, depending on how many questions you will have. If any questions spring to mind while the talk is ongoing, please use the Q&A tool and we will respond to your questions during the Q&A portion at the end. We will try to answer as many of your questions as possible during the course of today's talk. Please note that the talk is also being recorded to be viewed on demand by yourselves and also future viewers. You'll be sent this recording by email should you want to access it again. I'm done with my bit, so I will now hand over to our official student host and budding AI expert, Cameron, to start today's talk. Uh, um, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Holly, for that wonderful introduction. Well, I should say good afternoon now. Um, so today I'm really excited to be joined by Dr. Caroline Ronnie and also Dr. Mohamed Al-Badawi. So please allow me to introduce myself briefly. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Cameron Young, currently in my last year of studying biomedical engineering. I was invited today because of my passion for AI, and I have a podcast called Cameron's Lab, which is where I've had the opportunity to interview other academics, such as Dr. Mohabit and Dr. Caroline. So I'm very excited to bring that into today. So allow me to introduce our guest. I'll start off with you, Dr. Caroline. So Dr. Caroline is a reader in computational medicine in UKRI and a future, sorry, in computational medicine and a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow. Her research combines um, signal and image processing for machine learning and computational modeling techniques to develop novel techniques for investigating cardiac arrhythmia mechanisms from clinical imaging data and electrical recordings. These tools aim to present to predict optimal for optimal patient spe treatment specific in the, in the clinic. Her work highlights interdisciplinary nature of healthcare, blending mathematics, engineering, and medical science, which all of us must find really exciting. And Dr. Mohammed, he is recognized as a top 2% scientist by Stanford University consecutively both in 20, 2022 and 2023, and focusing on the practical applications of digital technologies in healthcare. His expertise in machine learning, robotics, 3D printing, points to the diverse ways that AI is being employed in the healthcare industry. From predictive anal analytics to robotic surgeries and personalized medicine, his work exemplifies the innovation that AI brings to healthcare. I'm really excited to have both of you today. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Cameron. Absolutely pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Caroline, I wanted to start off with a little bit of your research. So I wanted to ask, for example, the digital twins that your research has. Could you briefly explain what that is? That it sounds a little bit like something out of a sci-fi movie. And yeah. also how you're being able to implement them with machine learning techniques to improve the efficiency of making those. Great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for the opportunity to be here today as well. And for, yeah, for the great introduction. Um, yeah, so... What do we mean by digital twins? So we mean it's a virtual representation. It could be of a cell, it could be of a tissue, of an organ, or it could even be the whole body. 
Um, but the key points that we have are that it should be personalised to the patient. So, for example, if we wanted a, a digital twin of someone's heart, then we'd need some imaging data um, and we might need, say, an ECG data, uh, some ECG data on their electrical signals, and then we personalise the model to the patient. And if later we have... Um, new data on the patient. So, for example, if we have data from a wearable like an Apple Watch or a Fitbit, then we can update the computer model with that new data and then make predictions. And we also have the coupling that if we make a prediction with our digital twin or our model, we'd then like to be able to say, OK, to the patient, you should change your treatment in this way based on the digital twin, or you should consider changing your lifestyle in this way based on the results um, of the simulations from the digital twin. So essentially it's a fancy computer model personalized <laughs> to a patient. And in terms of like how we use machine learning for this, so um, going from a large amount of medical imaging data and ECG data through to a a finer element like computational model takes a very long time to make the models. So what we do is, for example, we might use machine learning or AI to automate the segmentation. So that means if you have an MRI or a CT and you need to say where in the images you have the different chambers of the heart, we essentially train an, a network to predict that segmentation so that we don't have to manually do that. And that saves a lot of time in terms of building the models. And the same with like personalizing the models when we're working out what parameters we need in our models, we can use machine learning to make that much faster. And so speaking of making personalized approaches, so I mentioned before that your research is focused on, for example, cardiac arrhythmias. And I do remember, I, for those who don't know, Dr. Caroline, I had this privilege of her being my professor for a, smart, a short period of time where you introduced <laughs> this to us. So that was pretty exciting. So I wanted to know in terms of like personalization, because of how that, I guess the disease would be different from person to person, does using things like digital twins make it a lot, I guess, it's easier for you to be able to make it more personalized in that way? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I, th I guess, I guess a lot of the time, um, when they're when we're thinking about treatments is often what works for the average patient or even in a clinical trial people will be grouped into different groups and then compare different treatments but you often just say broadly based on someone's um treatment based on someone's um yeah properties and some uh, basic features do we think a treatment will work or not but actually like as we know we're all very different we have different genetics um we yeah different um lo lots of differences in terms of the shape of our heart and the, the size and the electrical properties the scar tissue and so if we can bring all of that into a digital twin then we can make predictions that are much more personalized to an individual and it's challenging for a clinician to do that because essentially there's so much data um, and a lot of times it's not necessarily known how all of the different features will affect a person's um likely outcome with with a different treatment so the digital twin helps us to bridge that gap essentially and thank you for mentioning that that difficulty that clinicians have to make it personalized for each um, patient because I was going to ask you Dr. Muhammad if you wouldn't mind explaining in your own research for um, drug delivery how are you able to make sure that they are I guess personalized to each patient in that way and then how does 3D printing come into that as well sure um, yeah so a really good question uh, of course, the next frontier in medicine is personalized medicine, but it's also precision medicine. How can we precisely make uh, therapeutics tailored to the individual? Um, 3D printing is what we refer to as a digitalized fabrication technology. It, if you told the 3D printer to move by half a millimeter, it will do exactly that. If you told my hand to move by half a millimeter, I don't think it will do that. Even, you know, I played a lot of sports and whatnot. But um but yeah, essentially, it's a lot more precise than uh, than than what the uh, than what a human person can do. Um, currently, now medicines are being made by hand in hospitals or or, or in um, in pharmacies, and it's it's just not precise. It's you know, humans were good for many things, but our precision isn't quite there. Definitely not at the same level as say AI or three D printing. Um, so yeah, three D printing can allows allows us to precisely develop the medicine. Um, and then AI is helping us to compute all the amount of data because when, when it comes to making a medicine, there's a reason why it takes 10 to 15 years uh, for that to happen. 
Um, mm. So many factors uh, to, to, to consider. And then AI is doing that for us at a much faster pace than, than what we can do um, as, as humans. Definitely. And then I think one of the papers that you mentioned before, it was AI generates 3D printing formulation. Um, they mentioned that human ingenuity is crucial, but as you mentioned, sometimes humans can make a little bit of mistakes as well. So how are you able to, I guess, balance that need for human ingenuity and creativity when you're bringing in these AI models? So, yeah, I guess if we're in research, we're, we're very curious individuals. We, we like to really push the frontiers of science, um, but uh, sometimes it, it can be, there's a lot of fatigue, you know, um, and then it takes a lot of time to generate new ideas, especially for solving, uh, you know, for solving natural problems, for solving medical problems. It, it requires a lot of uh, a lot of ingenuity. And uh, yeah, recently we've started pushing, started asking if AI can can figure out uh, and, and be creative and come up with solutions for treating these. So in, in that recent paper that you mentioned, uh, we just asked it to see if it can come up with its own medicine formulation. And then it turns out it did. Um, and then rather than just leaving it as a theoretical paper, we decided to test it and see if it's actually if the medicine can actually be physically produced, and it turned out that it can. Um, so yeah, that's that's it in, in a nutshell. It's it's. I think we take it for granted. Uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, I think Barack Obama, in order to prevent decision fatigue, they used to wear the same thing day out and day you know day in, and then just leave the decision making for the real things. And, and uh, if AI can do that for us, then it can hopefully open up new avenues for uh, for, for the medical sector. Mm, I agree. And I want to bring it back to you, Dr. Caroline, for so for your research, as you mentioned, there's this need for making it more personalized, which is, I think, the kind of like a theme for using AI in healthcare to be able to make it more personalized and easier for people to have access. Um, how would you, I guess, deal with the privacy side of that? So, for example, when you have all of these different models from your different patients, how are you able to, I guess, maintain that level of privacy? Do people trust it more because they know it's their own data? What have you experienced so far with that? Yeah, so I guess a lot of the time, yeah, so it's very important that, first of all, that data is anonymized if it's being used in a, in a research study or at least pseudo-anonymized. And what pseudo-anonymized means is that there is a list that will link back to a patient, but we wouldn't have it on the engineering side. It would just kind of be kept in the hospital. Um, but essentially, the data has to be anonymized so that in the imaging data, we don't have any of the the patient characteristics um, and anything that could link it back to the patient. And if we have to keep things in mind, like if someone does have a very um, a, a rare disease with like kind of a low um, prevalence or something that could really mean that you could identify that person, then that case would need to be excluded from a study, for example, so that you can't get back to the, so that it's very challenging to go back to the original patients. But Another way of getting around um, kind of dealing with the issues of privacy is using synthetic data. So what you can do there is we might um, originally, for example, have lots of art anatomies and we then make a statistical shape model based on all of the anatomies and then make different anatomies from that. So essentially the different models or virtual patients aren't and they don't represent any real patient. They've they've come from a, a, a synthetic approach. And synthetic data and AI is being used a, a lot more to get around um, the challenges of data privacy. Definitely. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit more, I guess, for the, the cardiology side of it, for those of us who are a bit more interested in that side. I wanted to ask, how are you able to bring in AI for that side? Because when, I guess, when, when we're learning about things like cardiology in class, most of the time you see... This will all be human based. You have the machines and everything like that. But then how do you transition to start making that more automated? Are there any challenges you've noticed when you're doing that? Yeah, so I guess AI is used in a lot of um, aspects of cardiology and, and radiology as well. So it can be used, um, as I was saying, for like automating the segmentation or and it can be used in the, in some cases for automating a um if you're doing a diagnosis from imaging data and in that way it can help a radiologist or if if there aren't necessarily um yeah it can do a, a first screening of of um of of the diagnosis and then it would be checked by a radiologist so it, it can kind of be used 
in that way directly. Um, or what we're really aiming to do is to use it to test new treatments um, to really personalise that to a patient. So, for example, with atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heart rhythm in the top chambers of the heart, we'd like to be able to, um, there's kind of two different ways of treating it, either with antiarrhythmic drugs or they can apply a radio frequency energy um, to essentially like burn the tissue and stop the electrical wave from propagating. Um, so we're looking at new ways for how you should design where you should ablate the tissue essentially and, and using the AI with the physics-based models I think is kind of where we see the advantages of both because it captures kind of the the physics and the physiology of the patient um, but it also runs quickly enough mm. that you can use it in the clinic and it also learns from all the population data that we have um, to yeah make better predictions in the patient specific models so for us it's kind of that combination I guess. And then if I could take it back to Dr. Mohammed, especially for the pharmacy industry. So like you mentioned, just wanting to have that personalized, wanting to bring it into make it easier for people. So how would you say that AI is really affecting the pharma industry? So for example, the pharma industry is huge and it's quite an old one as well. So it must be hard to make changes in such a large industry. How are you finding that your research has been able to be adopted thus far? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, I think uh, just uh, just in the first part of that question, yeah, yeah, they are. They're huge. Um, you know, you've got Pfizer's, GSK. They've been around, I think, for the best part of 100 years, maybe more. Um, but uh, yeah, AI is really, really impacting the sector. I think the best and most recent example would be Moderna, the guys who brought out the COVID vaccine in, in nine months, where typically it takes years to bring out a vaccine, if not a decade to bring out a vaccine. And, and they've attributed AI helping them to consolidate all this amount of data I don't think if uh, most people will appreciate, but the pharma sector does generate a lot of data, even though they produce tiny little tablets, pills, they generate a lot of data. And then if, uh, being able to harness it is, is is a gift. Not many people can, but AI certainly can. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, they, they leveraged it and, and um, the impact of it was, you know, has been immeasurable. They, you know, COVID kicked in in the Western world, I think about March. By the end of the year, there was a vaccine. And about six months later, the world opened up. For us as well so um yeah being able to ha harness ai help them to achieve all of these immeasurable impacts um, my research in, in in particular um is focused on so there's ai is, is a huge field by itself that there's so many ways even if you're a computer scientist you could probably spend a, a bachelor's a master's and even a phd and you still wouldn't have covered uh, nearly half of it mm. what we're focusing on is using ai and making and, and utilize, utilizing the tools that will help the farmer industry um Techniques that will be able to accelerate research development, uh, techniques that will be able to uh, describe a drug such, such that a machine can understand it. And at the same time, uh, being able to have a 3D printer intelligently operate by itself. Um, other things are the regulatory sides as well. It's uh, medicines, uh, batch to batch variation is, is quite a key issue. Some batches in, 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 say, sent out to the US might behave differently to how they're sent here in the UK. So how can we minimize that batch to batch variation? So yeah, there's a lot of applications of AI, um, and then we're particularly focused on what could really help, um, you know, the farm industry, especially in the UK, really adopt mm -hmm. the AI technologies. I think the US and China are much, much further ahead. Um, so some of the things we're looking at is, you know, we have these small pharma companies in the UK, um, you know, their revenues in the millions, so it's not in the billions, not like some of these mm -hmm. big companies. And um, yeah, we're just helping them to try to compete with, with the big pharma companies. Um, oh, thank you. I'm going to move over to Q&A just because we have had quite a few questions in the, in the section. So the first one is actually for you, Dr. Caroline, from Tom, who asks, are digital twins new or has it been around for a long time? And what has changed in recent years? Yeah, so I'd say, I guess they originally started more as like a concept within engineering. Um, so you might have a digital twin like of a plane, for example. Um, to reduce the, the amount of tests you'd have to do on a real plane. So you'd have a computer model um, and, and then, yeah, you'd run simulations there or like digital twins even of whole like engineering plants. Um, and the idea is that you have a continuous loop between 
the data that's collected in the environment with the machines or whatever it is you're testing. And then that then feeds into the model and then you can update both um, based on your predictions. Or you could, yeah, test lots of different variants of an aeroplane wing and then only have to test a few in real life. So that's kind of where we originally came from. In terms of digital twins in healthcare, We've had like com computer models around for a long time. So say like the first um, computer models of um, of uh, cardiac atrium potentials or within neuroscience are kind of from the 1950s, 1960s, kind of it's been it's been advancing from then. Um, but we really used to just call them. Uh, computer models or patient specific computer models of organs is now more recently that there's this real kind of drive towards the digital twin and it's kind of a, a lot more people are talking about it in terms of digital twins um, and in healthcare we sometimes miss the link back with in terms of updating the models with new data so in in not all of the time is it a fully coupled system but we'll often still refer to it as a computer twin a uh, digital twin but essentially it's yeah a, a fancy computer model <laughs> I think the word like digital twin makes it a lot more exciting than a computer. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think um, so. <laughs> so. I just want to just uh, um, add a little bit. Uh, so Siemens are also using digital twins. Um, so if you're in, so they're using it to basically simulate a, a factory uh, plant before they commission it. Um, so it's it's yeah, it, it's been used in the pharmaceutical industry uh, as well. I think it's. I don't know if um, Caroline's experience, but I think it's probably a little bit easier to to. Uh, Build a digital twin model around something that's um you know inanimate like like a machine or or you know glass file, um and then you know the, the stuff that's been applied there can also be translated also to to the healthcare sector, um and and then you know manufacturing your medicines as well. So we're learning from each other, and I think that's that's what I've noticed has been a recent change as well. Mm, thank you. The next question was: Many AI companies are making use of neuroscience. Can you tell why that's the case? I'm not sure who would be. Was suitable for that question. What was the question? Sorry. Um, many AI companies are making use of neuroscience. Can you tell why that is the case? Ooh, uh, it's a little bit outside my domain, but if if it's related to targeting a drug in in, in the mm -hmm. CNS central nervous system, then then um, AI is is being used to identify what are the possible uh, druggable uh, receptors or the druggable biological targets there. Um, but it's a little bit outside my domain. I mean, I guess the closest thing I have to neuroscience is uh, 3D printing synthetic neurons. Um, wow. It's not necessarily AI. It's just more synthetic uh, graphs. That's very yeah. cool. I wonder if it means as well, like in, in terms of some of the deep learning approaches that are coming yeah. in for medical imaging data, like the networks are often built. Um, so you'll have like convolutional neural networks that where the idea is that they're built based on how they think the brain might learn. Um, so I guess there are kind of those links, those links there, perhaps. Um, I want to do one of the pharmacy industry questions. Oh, thank you, Holly. <laughs> I was reminding us that there's another human led AI webinar next week, Thursday, where you can learn more about that as well. Um, so this was one for more of a, a pharmacy one. So they were asking, so Victoria says, AI is exciting and clearly very useful for medicine and pharmacy. Yet, what would you say the main barriers for wide adoption in the industry are? Thank you. I, I think generally, um, overall, the pharma industry is very slow to adopt these technologies. Um, there's, there, there's the human side of it. There's the technological side of it. It's, yeah, they're very slow to adopt technologies. And um, Moderna, much, much younger. I think they're probably about 20 years old, not, not very old uh, comparatively. So they're, they're young, they're agile, as, as most uh, young things are, and they just adopted it. Um, but, but we're seeing a massive change. Uh, AstraZeneca, about two weeks ago, put out a summer internship call asking for MSc students and PhD students with machine learning for pharmacy uh, experience to, to apply. So, so we know they're changing. Um, everyone is trying to copy the Moderna uh, format, you know, how can you quickly accelerate and get drugs out there as soon as possible and not spend 10 to 15 years and billions of pounds producing them? Um, so, so there are challenges, but uh, I think fortunately with AI and, and with the support of uh, um, the FDA, so the Food and Drug Administration, as well as the uh, UK's equivalent, the MHRA, um, they're, they're, they're changing their mindset and then they're reducing the, the, um, the, those uh, barriers. 
And then I really like this question from Tom. His 15-year-old daughter would like to know, isn't it dangerous to leave the decision-making to AI? What do we think? Uh, Caroline? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I at least in our, like at least in my research, we're not trying to replace the doctor in any way. The idea is that the AI is there, like as an additional aid, but the final decision will always be at least with the clinic with the clinician on how to treat the patient. But they might use that AI to to consider different treatment approaches and how likely they are to work. Um, but we're not. Yeah, we're not suggesting to remove it. And I know there have been studies like looking, say, with radiologists where they're where they've compared having a radiologist compared to having an AI compared to having both. And at the moment, some of the studies are showing that actually having the human plus the AI lead, does lead to sometimes worse um, predictions than either just using the human or using the AI. And that can be because of some of the um, influences between the two systems. So we really need to think, I think, going forwards of how, yeah, how do we best you help use the AI to help the clinician or to help the doctor and to make those then end up with decisions that are better because we've got both. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, definitely humans are, are you know, we're, we're fallible. We do make mistakes. Um, currently, incorrect prescriptions are costing the NHS about £100 million a year. So so there, there's an issue there and, and we're hemorrhaging a lot of money. So we do need new solutions. And, and as Caroline said, um, AI is helping us to minimize those errors as well. Um, it's not just the money that's, you know, that we're expending, but also, you know, we're, we're putting patients' lives at, at risk as well. And, and we need new innovative solutions to minimize these um, societal issues. Thank you. Um, the next question that they had was actually specifically for Dr. Caroline. Wait, sorry, Dr. Mohammed for this risk. I found it a little bit sooner. Um, so, Dr. Mohammed, in 3D printing, do we have any materials which can print autoclavable materials, just in case we want to print a customized jig that needs to be used in patient's mouth, for example? Yes, yes, definitely. We have commercial. Um, there's, you know, it's, it's. Uh, there's many, many people looking into this, and so there's, there are companies producing uh, readily made or readily available autoclavable materials. Um, and at the same time, we can also make them uh, in, in the lab, um, you know, try to create some new innovations as well, as opposed to just necessarily using these off the shelf. Um, yeah, in short answer, yes, there are. Thank you. Um, this one was for Dr. Caroline, really. I find it in time. But um, it's from Tanwell, who is an orthodontist interested in applications of AI. So they, he would like to know, Dr. Caroline, could your digital twin model be used for um, craniofacial region and predict effects of orthodontic treatment, for example, like for example extraction of teeth? What you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe this is, I guess, where we could combine kind of maybe my research and Mohammed's research too. Like, I think you could, I mean, anything that you can image and you can make a mesh of, you can make a, a computer model of. So you could definitely, yeah, if you could do some imaging of, of, of the teeth, then you could make a computer model and you could look at finer element simulations to look at stresses and strains on the teeth for example with um with different changes and yeah you could update them over time based on some measurements that you get so yeah there there are there is there are some finer element models that that yeah look at teeth and, and different types of uh braces or, or yeah to 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 see essentially forces, stresses and strains that you'd have on the teeth. I don't know too much more about it, though, so sorry about that. Okay. I mean, I, um, I don't other, know oh, that sorry. research. If if, uh, if you can quickly get in and get out of, of uh, dentist's um, surgery, then that would be great. If they can run all the simulations yeah. behind the scene, minimise the amount of pain they cause you, I think that that would be a dream. That would be a really, really good dream. Totally agree. It sounds like a lot, Like I think what the main thing for AI is, is it's a lot of having the data. So if you have the images, you have the data, it really does make a, a huge difference when you're trying to get these models to work properly. Um, so I wanted to ask a little bit more from M12, who asks to Dr. Caroline, um, are digital twins involved in heart transplants as well? Um, yeah, so you could, I don't know too much if they've been used in heart, heart transplants. I think... They've been they've been used in terms of like looking more at say congenital cases where you have different very different lots of differences in the anatomy where having a computer model of it could can help um, essentially plan in the treatment. Um, 
I don't know specifically about heart transplants or not, but that could be a really cool area to look at. Maybe. Um, this one's a little bit more related to just QM and the courses that we offer, so I'm sure either of you could answer this one, but it's just wondering what projects are available in the university around AI and healthcare? I'd say there's now um, a really cool like center for undergraduate research um, being led, I think it's by Dr. Giuseppe Viola, I think. And he is essentially pairs up um, undergraduate students with different labs across the university. And the idea is that you can get involved even from the first year of your degree um, and, and throughout. So you might even be in the same lab for three or four years. And when you have gaps kind of between lectures, then you can help out a, a bit. So we have um, we have two students at the moment who are here, here on that scheme. One of them, Kian, she's looking at using machine learning. So um, physics informed neural networks is like combining physics and machine learning for looking at um, modeling cardiac electrical activity. So yeah, she just comes in when she's got gaps between lectures and is is really enjoying it. So I think that's a great way to get to get involved. Um, it's not officially one of one of the courses, but it's outside of the degree. Um, I guess I wanted to ask a little bit more, I guess, for the impact on more of a global healthcare scale. So with the use of AI, it's, it's, like you mentioned, helping with automating things, making it more personalized. But how would you talk to us about, um, I suppose, getting access to those materials? So I know that, for example, Dr. Muhammad mentioned that with the, the NHS, we're losing quite a bit of money in terms of when we aren't able to predict things properly. So for those countries that may not have access to all the resources and data that we do, how do you, I guess, how does your, maybe not if your personal research, but how does the research with AI transform over to those other countries, if you have any insights on that? I can, I could probably take a stab at it. Um, <laughs> it's definitely, that's a really, really good question. I mean, uh, part of the, the reason why we're doing this is, is to make it as open and accessible and really to just improve, you know, um, to improve the lives of, of patients. Um, I guess there was a there was a research that we that we conducted last summer um, where we use these speech recognition models, which which are powered by AI at, at the end of the day, and we applied them here in, in the South London community, um, and then we found out that um, about eighty percent of the patients uh, let me let me rephrase that twenty percent of the patients couldn't even say paracetamol, and and the AI recognition models, speech recognition models, was detecting all kinds of different words, so. Um, they're powerful, they're, they've been applied, but for some reason they are neglecting some of the more deprived individuals. Um, so I'm from some from South London as well, so this is why it, it interests me. Um, so I think the, the thing that we need to do is, is uh, have more people interested and and, and um, start implementing AI in these, you know, in third world countries and other deprived areas. And, and from doing that, we'll be able to find out what are the gaps and then we can try to address them afterwards. I don't know if Caroline. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it's such a key point. The bias in the models, like, is essentially if, if a population of people are not very well represented in the training data for the models. So if it hasn't seen people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, or perhaps depending on ethnicity or age or sex or any anything, then it won't necessarily make as good predictions for those people that it would for people who have seen lots of training data for. And I think in terms of healthcare, they've shown that I think it was some of the predictions, I think for di diabetic um, re um, problems with the eye, like it worked better on people with lighter skin than darker skin, for example. When they looked at some of the predictions of segmentation from UK Biobank data, um, it, the segmentation accuracy was worse uh, for black people than white than white people, and it's just it's it's often because you don't have that data in the training data set, um, and we really need to be thinking about how do we make sure that everyone has access first, how it, everyone has access to these tools, but also that the data is as balanced as as we can make it, and that there are ways to account for it in the AI. But in in the end, like yeah, we really we really want everyone to be able to access the same the, the same types of imaging, the same types of AI. We don't want to end up where we have different systems because some people have more access to AI than others. And it's really it's really really challenging though. 
just what, I just want to add on to that as well. Um, I think the, the issue we have is that it's not enough AI practitioners. We, we know these problems exist, and, and it's probably why Queen Mary and some and other universities have also started offering these courses. The idea is to start training more people, get more mm. practitioners, and then they can go solve these problems. Um, yeah, it's a really good thought. I like the question. I wanted to ask a little bit more. I suppose there was one question in here that asked about the AI being applied to public health programs. I suppose that does piggyback off of what you both mentioned of needing this more people to actually practice it, but also more people to, I suppose, provide that data so that we're not missing any gaps. So if you could talk more about it from a public health perspective as well. I mean, briefly, I mean, there's plenty of uh, public health data. Um, I've, I've worked with individuals who work for, for the public health uh, England. Um, there's plenty of data that they're using simple analytical simple mathematical models so there, there there's huge opportunities but yeah that, as i said there's just not enough of us to start you know spreading ourselves uh um you know taking care of pharmacy take like caroline taking care of uh, cardio surgery and at the same time helping the public health sector but um there, there's opportunities there's definitely definitely but there's plenty of data as well i think that's the key thing yeah yeah i, th I think so and just making sure as well like whenever we do our research we really try and focus on like involving patients, involving the public so that we can see like why why people would or wouldn't want to be involved in a research study. So if, if it's a study with digital twins, like if you don't know what a digital twin is, you probably don't want to be involved in the study. And it's it's all of those things that making sure that we're that we can access um yeah access people access all populations that want to be involved in research as well and, and it's really yeah about education and that that side I think is important but and then from another perspective I wanted to ask I think Dr Mohammed, you already mentioned how the pharmacy industry is slight, is beginning to in integrate your research but how would you say that healthcare professionals perceive and adapt to the incorporation of AI tools in their daily practice are they more welcoming to it or like you said Dr. Karen like they don't know what it is they don't want to integrate it so how would I say that for either of you really are people integrating these tools are they more for it or against it what have you noticed so far I mean for me personally I've, I've noticed many of them are for it uh, especially the younger uh, clinicians um, they're looking at how the NHS is being operated and, and they don't like the, the wastefulness of it um, and so I'm, I'm always approached uh, by, by my clinician friends oh could AI do this could it help me with my medical writing could it predict if a patient is likely to come to the MRI surgery, uh, MRI, um, um, MRI appointment or not? So some are absolutely up for it. I think it's it's just one of these things where the regulatory body and then the NHS can be slow moving. Um, but I think when they see that the pharmaceutical industry is adopting it, maybe they'll be a bit more inclined. Um, having said that, I should give credit to the NHS, actually. They've, they've got the NHS yeah. digital. They've got the NHS X. So, so they are looking into it behind the scenes. Um so hopefully, uh, you know, once critical mass is reached, hopefully things will start changing. Yeah, yeah, I, th I, th I think that I've had the same kind of experiences. Like, we we work a lot with clinicians and we have lots of collaborators and they're all very, very positive. Um, but And I think it's very key for us, like on the engineering side, to make sure that we always have that clinical input so that we know that we're answering the right clinical questions so that we're not... You know, we can make really fancy computer models to look at things that are not relevant, for example. And just I, th I think like I think all kind of research uh, uh, needs to be kind of but having that co-creation means that hopefully we we end up with the with the tools that are most impactful. And that it does help us as well to to gain trust. But, yeah. I think, I think generally we have very positive collaborations with Bart's Hospital and, and other hospitals. So, yeah, it's, it's great. I think in my own classes, we did like a little bit of going to the one of the hospitals. So they are premier theory, but they're useful for that. We're able to go into the hospital and learn a little bit more. Second year, if you do do biomedical engineering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to take it back to the digital twin since we did just mention it. Um, Is there any current research on fully automating surgeries or other innovations using digital twin models? Neural would like to know. 
Um, I'd say for planning, yes. Um, there's, I guess, quite core areas of robotics um, where they're l- looking at uh, kind of using a bit more robotics to control the catheters. I wouldn't, I don't know if you'd, I guess it is kind of a digital twin, but that, that would be more in kind of the, yeah, ro- robotics side. So, yeah, so there's very... Very cool robotics research as well at Queen Mary. There's the Advanced Robotics Centre. Um, there's very cool um, research in uh, kind of in 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 loads of different things. So like in endoscopes and ha- having automated um, cameras or yeah, in, in controlling catheters with robotics. So I'd I'd say those those areas are probably more towards the automating the surgery. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for bringing up the robotics as well, because I did want to ask Dr. Muhammad a little bit more about his own robotics research. I think one of the re- the recentish papers that I saw was on um, biomimetics in healthcare. So, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about that, and maybe if you bring AI into that at all, we talk about that. Sure. Um, yeah, I think it's you know AI is all virtual um, for the majority of it, and and the robotics are more on on the physical side. So, if if AI can make the decisions. Then we need somebody to actuate it, somebody to actually act, and that's where the 3D printing and the robots um, have come in. Um, I spent two years in Sweden. I was working with uh, the robotics uh, um, team over there. They build robots for climbing up walls, cleaning windows, you know, cleaning the underside of um, of uh, airplanes and all of that. And we just started to have discussions and start finding out how we can begin to implement them uh, in in healthcare. Um, so last year we ran a project. We had a robotic arm. Uh, what one of the issues that we've uh, we've seen in 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 healthcare is um, it's it's quite difficult um, to uh, I won't say it's quite difficult, but it's quite wasteful to produce um, uh, you know to 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 apply wound dressings. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, last year we we had a project. Um, we we had a robot kitted uh, turned into a three D printer, so then it can apply the wound dressing onto the patient uh, directly. Um, we didn't use a real patient; we used a, a prosthetic arm. Um, and at the same time, we had somebody build an AI machine vision algorithm behind the scene to help the robot. So it can be anywhere, you know, oriented, looking in any direction. Um, I should say robot arm, not, not entire robot. This is just a, a robotic arm equipped with a camera. Um, you know, we would put the arm in all kinds of orientation and then let it by itself figure out where the, the wound is. And then afterwards, start 3D printing on top of it. Um, so, yeah, this is an example of, of how you can use AI to make decisions and, and identify, segment, look look for the target, and then the robotic arm uh, to actually actuate it and actually perform the action. And then hopefully in the future, maybe extend it from a robotic arm into an entire robot. But again, uh, we need more practitioners and we need more people, and, you know, more human resources. Exactly, yeah. Um, I think that does kind of lead into a little bit more of like what people have said in terms of AI. You've probably already heard it, but like when you're, when you're doing AI, people are going to lose their jobs. But I think what's your, what you guys have been mentioning so far is that there's actually creating a need as well for more people to be working in AI to get on the research and not just on the computer side. So Dr. Muhammad, you mentioned more of a physical side with the robotics. So could you talk more about that in terms of like how your own research has probably opened up more opportunities in this space as well? Yeah, I mean, the only reason why I got into AI is because there's so many challenges. Um, and then again, I've only got two hands. So, so AI is helping me to tackle um, some of these challenges simultaneously. You know, as I'm talking to you now, I have a code running for to defy, for, for looking for, um, I think I can say it, for new cannabinoid uh, drug target potentials. Um, so I'm sitting here and, I'm, and, and the code is running in the background. Um, so so I'm, I'm, I'm able to do multiple things. In terms of, of losing jobs, I, I can understand it. I mean, it's it's not my intention, but by all means, I don't think it's anyone's intention. Um, but society has been through this many, many times. You know, when when the photocopier came, a lot of secretaries lost their jobs. Um, similarly, when 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 computers were invented, I guess a lot of uh, you know a lot of people who used to you know database entries lost their jobs as well. But um, this is something I guess beyond research. I guess we need you know policymakers and governmental input to help train people and, and help them find new ways of, of you know, um, being impactful in society as well. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. I think no one's going to leave you stranded, uh, definitely. Yeah, we really need all the human innovation as well, as you were saying, like the, the new research directions or how to, you know, what to do with the AI, how to how to use it. And it just it just means we can accomplish more, I think. Yeah. And then for the students that are coming up into this AI space with all the new AI robots, 
and everything. How did you say that future students that are studying healthcare topics are being like, how are their studies changing with the aid of AI? This was from Zara who asked the question earlier. Um, do you, I guess, I guess, do you mean in terms of, yeah, I, Sorry, I, th I think, I, I think it's, it's I, I, I don't know, because I, I, I think it's probably helping, helping people to, yeah, to, to study, to, to, to do things more quickly, to, to get a starting point, um, I guess in terms of coding, like people would Previously, you'd use perhaps you Stack Overflow to get a starting point with your code. People are now using Chat GPT to get a starting point with their code, um, and it's just it just means that if you've got that understanding as well, I guess you can you can do things more quickly. And I think um, you'll see like AI has so many really cool applications in in the medical field. So if, if it's yeah improving diagnosis or uh, or analyzing, as we say, large imaging data sets or combining it with robotics. There's just so many cool areas that is being applied. So having that understanding and knowing how to apply it will just opens up so many, so many different areas, I'd say. Yeah. Well put. And I wanted to ask a little bit more. Somebody else's question was, um, this was the nominous one. But what are your thoughts on integrating a doctor into an AI model so that they can, that whenever a patient searches on the AI platform, they receive real-time medical advice and a disease diagnosis from a qualified professional? I think you touched on that briefly before, but I think if you could just explain a little bit deeper. Yeah, I guess I guess one thing like we have to remember is we were kind of yeah as I spoke to some of our clinical collaborators about it, and they were saying like about the importance as well of like the clinicians kind of um yeah they're 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 quite obviously their interaction with the patient we definitely don't want to lose that because you have they're so they have like the clinicians touch like they're kind of there's lots of nuanced kind of decisions and understanding and I guess it can help if if you have something that's automated and give some initial guidance but we we'll always need the clinician I think to to bring that together and to say to communicate that and to communicate all those differences uh, I, th I think um yeah but it, it can be a, it can be a good starting point uh, Dr Mohammed, did you have anything to add to that side maybe uh so the question was was it putting AI into yeah. Actually, sorry, I'm going to change my question, actually, because okay. um, in the in one of the previous papers, well, sorry, your most recent paper, I would say, um, for AI generates 3D, novel 3D printing formulations, just in the abstract itself, you had mentioned how human ingenuity is so required, especially in that, like you mentioned, for the physical side of it, so you can keep track to see what's happening. Obviously, we make little mistakes, but bringing in that human ingenuity is so important. Um, could you talk about how a little bit, like go into a little bit more depth of how, I guess, AI is able to not only assist, but I suppose like really be, yeah, assist, be that second helping hand that you have when you're doing your own research, especially for the drug delivery side. So if we can talk a little bit more about how you're able to integrate in that way. Yeah, so I, I have different research avenues. Um, you know, one of the things is this 3D printing medicines, again, for the interest of precision medicine. I've got other, um, you know, working on on natural products as well. So I've got many, many different research avenues and, and it's just quite hard to switch my mind from when I'm working with a 3D printer to working with a robotic arm. So, uh, again, trying to achieve multiple things uh, for, for the interest of, you know, improving society. Um, and I can't clone myself. I don't think there's any technology at the moment that will allow me to physically clone myself. So I'm I'm looking for AI to essentially clone myself and, and you know, clone my um, my, my team as well. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting there. Um, we're, we're not doing anything, you know, that's kind of reinventing the entire wheel where we're looking at how AI is being applied in other domains and then repurposing it for, for the for the pharmaceutical sector as well. Um, and so far, it's 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 working very good. We're getting positive response where we're getting, you know, pharma companies asking us, could you do this? Could you do that? You know, um, our governments are on the back of us for CO2 emissions. Could you please find help us build the model that can help us to reduce our CO2 emissions mm -hmm. and so forth? Um, but yeah, there's, we're, we're only at the cusp. Uh, sorry, we're only at the, the you know, at the beginning. So, um, there's a lot, lot, lot to be done, and, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but we do need more people um, and, and more human resources. 
And to try to just back, piggyback off of that a little bit more. So you already mentioned like the future and how everything is, everyone's starting to become very interested in AI and how it can be used. And so for the for global health tech industry, I believe it's valued to be about $549 billion by the 2028. Have you all noticed any emerging technologies in terms of trends, such as AI, that you've noticed and that you think might contribute to this in your own research or, for example, in the carbon side, like you mentioned, Dr. Muhammad, but mostly healthcare, if you could take that back. So, yeah, I mean, there's many, many things, um, I, I guess. Uh, uh, so a AI in, in the pharma industry, for, for the most part, is, is just a tool. It's, it's accelerating these developments. Um, we have a clinical condition. We have a clinical need. How can we quickly develop a drug and a therapeutic? And, and what people are finding out is, is AI can reduce that time, as Moderna have demonstrated. Nine months to, to get. I'm not a spokesperson for Moderna. I don't work for them at all. Um, but but I'm still shocked that, that they managed to pull it off in, in nine months. And it's the same. Um, I don't want to sound morbid, but who knows what other planetary or human threat is around the corner. So uh, we want to be prepared. And, and, and that's what um, AI is helping us uh, to, to achieve. Um, but yeah, there's also enabling technologies. I think, you know, Apple now are bringing out these uh, M1 chips, M2 chips, M3 chips. That are, that are making it accessible for people to build models uh, just on, on, a, on a laptop, small-scale models. Um, but yeah, I think, um, again, just lastly, uh, before I pass on to Caroline, um, in, in the AI drug discovery and AI drug development sector, well, we're finding uh, startup companies are, are establishing themselves um, and then um, really pushing the, the envelope and then pushing the, uh, the, back, the, the research uh, frontiers as well. Um, so they're driving the market as well. And, and, you know, the pharma companies are looking to see what they're doing um, and acquiring them when needed. Um, but, yeah, there's, there's many factors. And, and you know, half, half a billion, um, it's a, it just suggests that there's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of potential and, and a lot of, um, you know, jobs are going to be uh, incorporated and, and implemented. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I think, yeah, as you're saying, like digital health as well, like there's lots of apps coming out now. Um, you can look at characterizing your movement or your gait or like looking at, your, you know, like all these healthcare apps that are being developed by different startups and different digital health companies that mean we can really kind of focus as well on early intervention. So helping people as soon as possible, making different lifestyle choices and, and improving outcomes that way so that people will have healthier lifestyles and, and then there's less burden on the NHS later. I think there's lots of cool, really cool areas where AI can help there as well. Um, I want to take it back to the Q&A section. So somebody named Conwell has asked for Dr. Caroline, I believe, um, how much of your digital twins predicted changes in treatment and how is their accuracy? And then also, like, if you could describe any experience that you've had while using them, especially if you've used them in real life patients. Yeah, so we're still um, looking a lot with retrospective data. So that's uh, people that have already been through the hospital and we're analysing their data and, and trying to mechanistically understand um, their type of, of arrhythmia. We're not yet at the stage where we're using it in the clinic, but that's what we're trying to do next. So we're really excited about that. But at the moment, we're testing them. And what we're finding is that when we add um, our finer element simulations and use machine learning or AI um, with like imaging data and the patient history data, we see an improvement in the prediction than if we don't use the, um, the physics-based simulations. So the combined approach does, does seem to be improving our ability to predict. Um, so we're really excited about that, but we're, and we're now um, doing more validation and doing more work on quantifying the amount of uncertainty we have. So there's lots of uncertainties in the data that we bring into the models and seeing how that then affects our predictions. So we're doing lots of development work there and then hopefully then get it into the clinic. So yeah, very exciting. I think just because we are just a tiny bit low on time, so I'm just going to try to <laughs> summarize the last few questions. There were quite a few that wanted to be more specific in terms of like the courses and things that we're looking at with Queen Mary. So I was wondering if both of you would be able to give, I guess, a little bit of a highlight of your own research here at Queen Mary and what kind of courses you think, like where people might be able to see you or learn a little bit more from your own research and how they could get involved in that way. Sure. So, yeah, sorry, do you no, want no, to go please. first? Uh, oh, no. I, I, can, yeah, I can try to keep it brief. So, so we run an uh, MSc course in AI for the biosciences. Um, it combines quite a broad aspect of biosciences 
Um, in the first semester, they cover genomics, uh, they cover uh, chem informatics, ways of representing the digital, uh, sorry, the physical world in, in such a way that the machines can understand them. Second semester, uh, they, they come to me and then my colleagues as well. Then we teach them. Um, I focus more on, on the fundamentals of AI, but also how to build the model, for example, to predict drug, um, drug biological targets. So um, they cover that. And then in, in the summer, they work on a project. Um, you know, they, they start applying and exercising all of the knowledge that they that they've learned. Um, we have projects, uh, again, the projects are, are research led. Um, I do get the students involved in, in some industry led projects. You know, if a company says to me, can you build a model for, like, for, for this and that? Um, I turn it into a project and then I get the support of the students as well. Um, and yeah, so yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it. So yeah, they, they learn fundamentals of AI. It's not, I can't, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to use this word, but it's kind of like a conversion course. So if you're a biomedical scientist, not much coding experience in the first semester, you'd be taught not just the informatics side, but also the coding as well. And then by the time you come to me, you, you'd you know Python, you'd know R, and we can start showing you how to, uh, you know, put these models together. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, I, and I teach within the biomedical engineering, so the School of Engineering. Um, and uh, in terms of my research, I'm based, uh, I'm also based in Derry, so the Digital Environment Research Institute. Um, and for teaching, I teach in the neuromuscular um, bioelectricity biomechanics course. So there, and um, we try and bring in like the digital health side of analyzing movement, so the biomechanics, and and link that to different um, healthcare apps that are coming in, so that you'll see, in terms of where you can go with digital health and where AI can be used together with traditional biomechanics. Um, and I also teach on the. Med analysis in medical imaging course so that's a new course in biomedical engineering this year and as part of that we have a, a coursework where you look at image segmentation um in in different softwares and then in terms of the future areas for that then that would be automating the segmentation using deep learning and we do some matlab and python too so Thank you so much. Um, so it is approaching the end of the hour. Um, so I am going to have to jump in and start our goodbyes. But thank you so much to uh, everyone who has attended the talk today. I hope you found it as fascinating as I did. Um, thank you for all your very engaged questions. Um, we covered a lot of ground, I think, in a short time. Um, and I'm sure we could all stay here for another hour. But um, unfortunately, we have to let you go. Um, thanks so much to Cameron and to our panel for taking the time to share their expertise and lead this discussion. If you enjoyed today's talk, we have two more coming up next week, both with Cameron. One is about AI ethics and the other one is called human led innovation in AI. So that will be covering uh, more robotics and kind of human led work with these systems so please do sign up for those if you're interested through our ai hub and this has been sent to you via email so that is the end um best wishes to everyone i hope you enjoy the rest of your day and hope to see some of you next week at the other sessions bye thank you nice meeting everyone bye. thanks so much bye hi again awesome listener that wraps up another deep dive of Cameron's Lab Dive In. Before you dive back into your day, see what I did there? Take a second to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Want a behind the scenes look? Bonus content? Or just some good old STEM fun? Follow me on my socials, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Cameron's Lab. And remember, every episode is a new adventure and we've got some thrilling dives lined up for you. Don't miss out. Until next time, Stay curious and keep exploring.